Welcome back to the Introspect Podcast. This is finally episode two. I finally got around to it. I tried recording this episode a couple times in the past few weeks, and it just didn't really work out. And I didn't like the kind of, I didn't like the, the way it was going. So I think I finally have what everything I want to say kind of pared down and that is on the topic of the anima and the animus. So if you're into Jungian psychology at all, you've probably heard of these. Uh, and if not, I'm going to explain what they are. But basically, there is plenty, there are, there have been plenty of people who have talked about this topic um, on YouTube, you know, since, basically since Carl Jung started talking about this stuff decades ago. But I feel, I've noticed, that there's a real knowledge gap as far as who, you know, how this information is being portrayed. And I don't see a lot of practical information. I see these two things um, being shared, you know, in spiritual circles in sort of like a fun woo-woo sort of way, which is fine. That's totally fine but also in an academic, super heady, intellectual sense that, you know, universities and psychology majors tend to go. And again, that's okay. But for me, the whole point of this stuff is using it for self-awareness. And I haven't, I mean, obviously anima and animus, it's the whole point of it is for self-awareness. At least I think so. Uh, but I have not, I, I've seen very little information that really drives home, like, this is what this topic is about. This is how you can use this. This is why this matters to you in your life. And so first, I just want to give a, a definition. I'll try to keep it pretty brief, but in case there's any confusion, a definition of what the anima and the animus is. So when we're speaking in terms of the subconscious mind, we have men who traditionally, it has been said, have an unconscious feminine aspect. That's That would be the anima, A-N-I-M-A. -A. And then females, women, who have the unconscious or subconscious male aspect. That's the animus, A-N-I-M-U-S. So the anima is the unconscious feminine and the animus is the unconscious masculine. Now, a lot of people think this is just gibberish. Um, there's also a lot of modern, modern day people I've seen writing, you know, articles and blogs and stuff who I assume are very liberal <laughs> and hate this concept because they think it's all about sexism. Uh, you know, like putting people into rigid categories of this is what men do and this is what women do. Uh, I couldn't disagree more. I think that's a total misunderstanding and I totally see how you could think that if you're just skimming the surface of this stuff. But one, once you really get an understanding and, and start delving into this information you will see that it, it has nothing to do with sexism or rigid thinking in terms of gender, and I'll, I'll go into this more, uh, and everything to do with understanding the nature of everything, <laughs> the nature of just the two polarities of masculine and feminine, and how those polarities... Uh, connect, you know, are in relationship with each other. And that's, that's yin and yang, right? That's a, a universal perspective of two different energies. And with anima and anima stuff, we're just looking at how it plays out in individual humans. That's all we're doing. So we're taking the yin yang concept, which if you're unfamiliar with that, I have an article up on the blog about um, the magic of yin that kind of, it has like a chart there that tells you, you know, the two different polarities, yin and yang. 
And so the reason this is not about putting people into rigid gender categories is that, like I said, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, these are universal. So anything, everything in existence has a quality to it or various qualities to it. Some of those qualities uh, fit into a more receptive role, or you could consider them to be more receptive, more uh, intuitive, more related to emotion, more related to creativity, um, basically the opposite of logic, right? So that would be the yin or the feminine. Then we have the polarity of things that are logical, linear, action-oriented, basically the opposite of that murky yin. It's much more straightforward and direct. That would be the yang. So we're talking about those masculine qualities. So that's what we're talking about here when we say yin and yang. So those qualities exist in all human beings. It doesn't matter if you identify as male, female, or anything else. Those polarities, those characteristics exist in you because you're a human. You're part of existence. So, you know, if someone is um, bisexual or homosexual or uh, non-binary non or transgender, they those people may not relate to this in the exact way I'm going to lay it out. This is just to say, this is how this stuff often plays out for men and women who identify as male and female. So it applies to everyone, but it may apply in slightly different ways to different people. Everyone has a subconscious mind, right? And everyone has cultural conditioning. Everyone lives in a culture. Unless you have lived your entire life out in the wilderness by yourself, you have cultural conditioning. And it seems so normal to you that you wouldn't, most of the time, you don't even second guess it, you just take it as fact, when in rea reality, a lot of the things we take as fact are cultural conditioning. Okay, so with that said, Cultural conditioning plays into these anima animus roles that men and women play. So there may be some ways that it's very healthy and some ways that it's very unhealthy. Now, as we're developing as children, so we're, we're getting that cultural conditioning funneled into us from school, from our parents, from our other friends, um, you know, just being out in the world, we're taking in that cultural conditioning that says this is how you have to act and this is how you can't act. Now, for men and women, as you probably have noticed, that conditioning is different. We have men being conditioned one way and women being conditioned in other ways. So that is playing into how our subconscious forms with this anima animus stuff. In addition, we can say that it we can say that it benefits people to choose a polarity, for example, choosing ma male or female, and it may also benefit people to not choose one of the, those polarities if they don't feel that it identifies them. So so there's value in all of the ways that you could basically construct your gender without going like too deep into this philosophical thing, there's, there's value in all of those experiences. And so when people do strongly identify as male or female, as, you know, probably the majority of people do, that kind of automatically puts the other, the opposite gender, into your subconscious. So if you strongly identify as female, all of the male aspects of you, the characteristics in you that are masculine, so like I was saying, yang, that linear, logical, assertive, drive, and I'm, I'm gonna get into where I'm getting this from too, because there's, you know, there's research that supports this. So if you identify as female, for example, your subconscious aspects 
are going to be a lot more male because you don't identify as male, right? It's going to be in your subconscious. So that's what this is about. And again, so in our society in general, people do not believe in masculine and feminine energies. The, the, the majority, the mainstream, you know, people who, especially people who run our culture, our society to some extent, the institutions, the government, the way everything functions, for the most part, those people, I would assume, I would strongly assume, they do not believe in masculine and feminine energy. They would probably assume that that is a sort of hokey, like Eastern philosophy idea, like a, like a yogi idea that is just sort of silly and ridiculous. And, so, and a lot of people that work in the scientific fields feel the same way. So that bias kind of prevents them from going into any of this and extracting any value from it. So the clearest evidence we have of masculine, masculine and feminine energies playing out in humans is the human hormonal structure. Now, this is something I first learned from Alison Armstrong. She's an author and kind of a, I guess, relationship coach for men and like basically someone who uh, helps men and women understand each other. And this stuff was kind of introduced to me through her. And she talks a lot about the difference between testosterone and estrogen, the symbolism behind those hormones and how they drive certain types of behavior. So this is totally relevant to the last video I did about how symbol, you know, symbolism, there's a, there's a symbol behind every action. It's the same with testosterone. There's a symbol behind that, right? Masculine. And so all those yang qualities I was talking about are going to be more present, more conscious, at the very least more conscious, in males, in masculine beings. Estrogen is going to sync up with a lot more yin qualities, and we're going to see that in the personality, in the behavior of the individual, the feminine being, right? So this is just, we have masculine, feminine, testosterone, estrogen, playing out within individual people in different ways. There are some research studies on how testosterone impacts behavior and how estrogen impacts behavior that basically support everything I'm saying. So, you know, if you're if you're more of the scientific mind, there is research behind this stuff. Okay, so let's dive into the male anima. This is a super interesting topic, and I don't know how I'm going to pare this podcast down. Honestly, it's going to take forever. <laughs> Because there's just so, there's so much that can be said here. The male anima, the, the subconscious feminine aspects of men, those, so here's the thing about the subconscious, as you probably know, if you listen to this, uh, if you're into shadow work and stuff, that the subconscious, uh, it's, it has a lot of trauma usually. There's usually a lot of trauma that goes into all the stuff that's in your subconscious. So when we take the anima, men's anima, there's often a lot of shame around femininity and that's cultural conditioning. That's not a natural process. So some of this can be just like a natural development. The shame around femininity is strongly cultural conditioning. And you will see this in all facets of everyone in the Western world has shame around femininity. Even women, we'll get into that later. But with men, it's particular because they were conditioned um, often by their fathers, their brothers, and even their mothers. Sometimes uh, they were conditioned to cut themselves off from all aspects of themselves that are feminine, yin. So, unfortunately, this is, the, the consequences are grave here. This means that we have a culture of men who have cut themselves off, you know, so seemingly by necessity. They've cut themselves off from their emotions, 
um, and everything that goes into that yin side of life. So essentially spirit, like the human spirit is yin, it's feminine. So everything, every quality that goes down the list of yin, creativity, emotion, um, things like hope and faith and what I like to call magical thinking. Um, again, it, because our culture is so stigmatized against the, the feminine side of the polarity, we think that we, we consider if I called you a magical thinker, most people would take that as an insult because we're, our culture is so like afraid of feminine that we couldn't possibly see how that might be valuable. As, you know, the worst insult you can give someone, especially a man who, let's say, works in a scientific or medical field or something like that, is to call him a magical thinker. That would be considered an in insult. In reality, though, without the cultural conditioning, magical thinking is actually really helpful for um, like mental health, well-being, the survival of the species even. Because when we have things like faith, hope, um, emotional connection, um, community, receptivity to new ideas, receptivity to other people's needs, um, you know, just belief systems, um, not necessarily religion, because I know that has some has gone down some negative paths, but spirituality itself is based, is kind of a yin thing. So being in touch with your spirit, your feelings, your creativity, all that stuff, that is what is in the subconscious for a whole lot of men. So that's what the anima is. It's all that stuff stuffed into the subconscious and unfortunately because it gets stuffed down there because men are shamed out of having feminine qualities they're shamed to they're they're taught to cut themselves off from that when it goes into subconscious it stops being so pretty so all those things i just mentioned the community connectivity and all that stuff it gets kind of dark when it's in the subconscious and it turns into things like, um, you know, like maybe emotional outbursts, manipulation, uh, resentment, um, being controlling, frankly, the, the stereotype of being really bitchy, <laughs> that's all anima stuff. That's like uh, the dark side of the feminine great example of this is, you know, Donald Trump. We see him up at three in the morning on Twitter, like arguing with oftentimes other women and things like that. And, and you can't help but think, what kind of behavior is this? It's like, it's, it's the behavior of the immature feminine. So it's the anima of Donald Trump that's coming out in this weird way and because he is so uh people call him misogynistic or you know hating of women what he actually hates is his anima he hates his own feminine that's what he hates so any man who's super destructive um like the the, the donald trump stereotype really is all you need to look at for to see this extreme departure from between the man and his feminine so tons of shame there um the real integration that needs to take place here for men who are that far gone honestly men who are that far gone are, are not going they're going to resist at all costs they're not going to integrate their feminine aspects probably in their lifetime they're not going to do that but for the rest of men who are you know just not uh, super like crazy narcissistic way down that dark path, uh, they can, you know, regular men can start doing little things to integrate their anima. You know, getting in touch with feelings is uh, pretty much the number one way to do that. 
um, doing shadow work, doing meditations, doing anything for a man, anything that you're told you're not allowed to do because it's, quote, gay or girly or um, it makes you a pussy. All of those things are anima integration things that are really going to help you round out your personality, round out your life, and integrate your shadow quite literally. Okay, so the female, the female animus, the unconscious male within the female. So here's the interesting thing about living in the Western world. We have men who have all this shame around their feminine aspects and they're suppressing them because they've been taught to. They're taught that if you're girly, you're weak, you're terrible, you're not a man. So they're dealing with the shame of their feminine aspects keeping that stuff stuffed down. Women have a whole different thing going on. So Carl Jung's wife, Emma Jung, talks about um, women's bias against themselves. And I would say this is happening when, when you grow up in Western culture. The bias against the feminine is so strong here that's why we have things like hard sciences that people get paid a lot of money to do. They're taken very seriously. And we have soft sciences like liberal, liberal arts, you know, sociology, psychology, that, um, you know, art, that kind of stuff. I've known professors who belittle that, you know, and these are the people who are supposedly very wise and in, in charge of teaching young people. They will say that you know, anything feminine, any feminine learning modalities. I mean, forget about things like energy healing, super stigmatized, like super ridiculous. It's stupid, idiot, shut up. <laughs> that's, that's the narrative you'll hear if you go out into mainstream culture and try to talk about this. So women, the feminine is who they are. It's their consciousness. It's who they consciously are. So their shame can be around who they actually are. Whereas with men, it's like stuff that into the subconscious, we're ashamed of that. For women, it's this is who I consciously am, but stuff it down, it's shameful. So as Emma Young says, it's the hurdle for women is different. It's the bias against themselves. Now, how does this, how does this play into the animus? women can do this thing where, you know, again, <laughs> there's a reason stereotypes exist sometimes. Um, people are going to hate this, but bossy, you know, this rigidity, this, this, um, this overly rigid kind of bossy, um, super logical, that is when, in, when a woman is using her animus in the dark way. So when the animus, when the masculine is in the subconscious, we don't have a lot of ability to be logical, linear, rational, um, to take action. Uh, I know for me, this has played out as um, like there's no, there's not enough drive, like there's not enough um, action taking. There's not enough assertiveness. There's not enough confidence. So there could be, there could be boundary issues, inability to protect oneself, assert oneself. And like I said, it can also go into the whole realm of being, um, inability to be logical. Like there's an underdevelopment there, there of the logic the thinking can be like too magical to the point where it actually isn't good. The animus, when it's subconscious, the subconscious masculine in women, it takes on this, it can take on this dictator role where, and it, it, she can even like turn that in on herself. It doesn't have to be like she's running around. She Sometimes you can be taking it out on other people, but you can also turn it in on yourself. So I would say... 
I would almost say that this probably has some tie-in with the inner critic stuff. I hear a lot of women talking about, like, I have the worst inner critic. She's always, um, or my inner critic is always, like, belittling me and telling me, like, that, that problem is it comes from the masculine side of you. And we can go down this whole path of, like, what were our parents doing? Because we get our anima animus influences from our parents as well. That's a big part of it. So if you're having like an anima or animus issue that doesn't make any sense to you, one of the quickest, easiest things you can do is just look at your parents. You know, like, was my father this way? Was my, was my mother this way? And, and kind of how does that play into my inner dialogue? Okay, so hopefully you're still with me. That was a lot of information, but there's plenty more. So <laughs> maybe um, take a little breather, grab yourself a drink. Uh, you can kind of let that marinate and come back to the other half of this later if you want. But otherwise, we're going to dive right into the next part. And that is this really interesting thing that's going on now and this I would argue this is a super recent development this is like um, I think like maybe Millennials are seeing this dating is more confusing than ever and this is why I think okay so we have these anima and animus issues respectively for men and women and that, that has been going on for a while, right? Carl Jung started talking about this decades ago. Because we're not really into integration in this culture, like if you talk to the average person about this, they will probably not even really understand or believe you. So we're not living in an integration culture. Most people don't know how to do that. Even those, like even if you're listening to this, like, you haven't integrated everything yet, and neither have I. So, we still have these anima animus issues, everything I just talked about. That's been going on, and it is still going on. Now, on top of that, we have this new stuff happening. So, okay, again, maybe this isn't all new. So, the first... <laughs> I'm realizing that like this this has also some of this has been going on for a while as well. But so the eternal child complex, right? Carl Jung talks about this. This is a term he gave to men who are having issues with essentially their masculinity. So it's like the opposite issue. So imagine all of this is happening nowadays. We have we have men with the anima issues, so they have the unintegrated feminine, they don't know what they're feeling, there's all this confusion around all of their feminine aspects. And then on top of that, we have men's subverted masculinity, so there's a struggle with masculinity now as well because of this eternal child complex that's coming in for some people, not all people. So it depends on, Young says that it basically depends on how the man was raised. If you had uh, in, like a helicopter parent or like an overly coddling mother, uh, Young says that in those instances, you're more likely to have some of the qualities of this eternal child complex. So the eternal child complex is like, he, he named it that because he's, he's seeing this pattern in adults where they're unable to grow up in the traditional sense, like the independence, the taking care of yourself, all the things that come with bec becoming an adult. He was seeing this not happening for some people. And so for men, when we have this happening, this struggle to, you know, struggling with all those masculine things, uh, confidence, independence, asserting yourself, 
um, protecting yourself and your loved ones, like all of those aspects that make you feel like a confident grown up, the ability to like handle affairs, basically, like handle your shit. <laughs> the inability to do that, that's the eternal child complex. So we have men who have this issue and the animus issue, both of them. Issues with masculinity and femininity. Now, that's complicated. That's super complicated, but there's more. <laughs> it's going to get more complicated. We have women who have the animus issues that we already talked about as far as, um, you know, how they think, how they take action, this muffled animus that's in the subconscious, right? On top of that, we have this new healing process taking place around patriarchy so women are finally coming to understand that a feminine bias exists so you know there we've known this for a while we've had like the suffragettes and those whole the waves of um waves of feminism but with each wave it gets more it gets clearer and the bias the amount of bias that we're aware of grows and grows and grows. So for women uh, who are like my age right now, like 30, there is more awareness than ever about just how deep this bias goes. And so associated with all of this trauma around patriarchy for women, because there's, there's patriarchy, patriarchy trauma for men as well but with women we end up with these women who are cut off from their femininity right so when you're growing up in a culture like the western world where all things yang are valued and all things yin are undervalued or dismissed we have women going into this like animus overdrive like they're trying to be men essentially they're trying to cut themselves off from their femininity so that they can keep up in society and get respect in society so they have so women have this subconscious animus their masculine stuff going on and then on top of that we have patriarchy trauma that is causing women, and I, I see this super clearly, this is definitely happening, women who are trying to cut themselves off from being female. And I know this, like, before I had integrated a lot of this stuff, I was totally one of these people. I was just, like, super angry all the time. Um, and I know a lot of, some feminist media is has this slant to it where it's super angry and understandably but it's angry in a way that cuts women off from their femininity so by living in patriarchy uh, these women are they don't realize that they're sort of turning into what they hate they're turning into the oppressor even if they're not oppressing anyone outwardly, they're oppressing themselves. So it's like they're taking patriarchy and turning it in on themselves. And sometimes out on other people too. And this is just a trauma response. So they're just trying to gain ground and there's so much trauma and there has been so much bias and so much history of pain through the lines of, you know, you, your mother, your grandmother, and so on. As you go back, there's more severe trauma because, you know, it wasn't up until recently that rape was even a big deal. No one even considered that that was just a part of life you had to deal with back in the day, pretty recently. So we have all this trauma. So we have women going into this um, masculine overdrive to where... They're embodying patriarchy as a trauma response. So, whew, yeah. Again, it's funny because the prescription that I gave 
for for the men to integrate their anima you know like doing shadow work uh meditating feeling your feelings admitting you have feelings like all these all those sorts of things that's the exact same prescription that i would give to the female to the modern female so like i said you can see why this is why it seems like relationships are so complicated because they are and they don't need to be comp like it doesn't need to be everyone thinks that it's this men versus women thing you know like how many <laughs> how many like articles have you seen about like teaching women how to d defend themselves on dating apps and teaching men like here's how you get a woman to even respond to you on a dating app like it's a battleground. People people treat it as a battleground. And a lot of this is because people don't believe in this anima animus stuff and they don't they don't see how the trauma is playing in. They don't see how their personal cultural conditioning is playing in. And so when you're unwilling to look at any of that, and you're unwilling to do any amount of shadow work, your problems will continue until the day you die. The same exact problems will continue until the day you die. It doesn't matter who you date. You can date um, 10 different people in your life who all seem totally different than to you each time you meet them and have the exact same problems with them. And, you know, women think, oh, it's just men, they're awful. And men say, it's just women, they're crazy. But what you're seeing are the projections of your anima and animus. That's what people don't want to face. They don't want to believe that. They think it's gibberish. And that's why we see people in this endless spiral of confusion around male-female partnerships, male-female friendships, um, the dating world, uh, monogamy, polyamory, there, there's so much confusion because people are not doing their integration work. That's why there's so much confusion. I mean, it would be confusing either way, but, but the, it's painful when you're not doing the integration work because you truly think that the people around you, everyone around you is like attack, they're attacking you and they're out to get you. So that's where this battle of the sexist thing continues. And yeah, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna improve until people adopt an integration lifestyle. So we're, we got to destigmatize therapy. Um, the therapy models themselves a lot of them need to radically shift to actually help people understand what's going on with them. So it's a whole system upheaval that needs to take place. And it's taking place very, very slowly. Like if you, if you listen to this podcast, you are probably ahead of the curve with this stuff. Um, the fact that you're doing any integration work at all. I always tell people this <laughs> because people email me and say like, I'm having this problem and, and like, I don't understand, like, how do I do this? And, and I just say like, you're doing, like, I can tell by the things that you're saying that you're doing the integration work. So, you know, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I know that you can't know yourself. I don't know more about you than you do. It's just, a, it's a big learning curve and everybody's on it and everybody's at a different point on the learning curve. So we got to stop pretending that self-awareness doesn't matter at all and that we can just live lives perfectly happily without any self-awareness whatsoever. We have to stop that. And... So like I said, if you want to learn more, if, if you want to hear about the th this concept of people trying to integrate their shadow through their partner or through dating, basically like meeting people, um, and there's, there's some attraction there, like there's an attraction because they 
embody something that's in your shadow. This is the whole reason that men and women often pair pair off. It's because it's two polarities, so there's an, usually a natural attraction there. So if you want to learn more about the integrating, integrating through the other, I call it the relationship trap. I have a blog article up on that um, from, I don't know, months ago. You can scroll back in the blog and find it. That is the gist of what I want to say about the anima and animus and why it matters today. So if this topic interests you, feel free to leave a comment. Uh, sign up for the newsletter so you can see when new episodes are coming out. I've got the shadow workbook if you want to get started with your own integration. Step one is basically everything I talk about in the workbook. That's like the introduction to integrating your shadow. So thank you for listening and I hope that kind of expanded your awareness a little bit around these issues. I'd love to hear what you have to say about it and I will see you next time.